Hi everyone, this is David Pickering. Uh, I'm a current teacher at Main Branch. All right, today I'm going to go ahead and give you a quick introduction of Master Debate New to Program. All right, so let's get right into it. All right, today's agenda, we're going to be covering several things. First, we're going to start with the program overview, okay? Second, methodology. Hopefully, in front of you, while I'm going through this, you have the program guide with you, along with some scratch paper to take notes. Um, I'm going to try my best to give you tips uh, so that you can add value to your class as a whole. Um, third, we're going to go ahead and cover different debate formats. Specific, uh, specifically, we're going to go ahead and cover an informal style and a formal style, known as the British parliamentary debate for formal and the public forum debate for the informal, otherwise known as crossfire. All right, and finally, we're going to go ahead and touch up on the online component, okay? Here we go. So, program for masters. I personally find this class to be a very enjoyable class to teach, uh, one of my favorites actually, because the workload actually shifts away from you so much to the students. Now, it does not mean that your uh, prep goes down. Obviously, uh, your prep is a little different in ways to kind of strategize how to effectively teach debate. So hopefully, this workshop will go ahead and address some of those. All right, so what's the goal of Master Debate? It's going to expose, number one, the kids to the different types of debates. Number two, it's going to help them improve in their ability to kind of think critically as they look on different world issues. And finally, uh, in the end, hopefully their, their uh, ability to persuade and to present will increase as a whole. All right? All right. So, first of all, you need to kind of know the difference between the elementary and the middle school class for debate. Elementary, it's going to be a little more watered down. Uh, they're going to rely more on handouts that are available on the FTP. Number two, they're going to go ahead and have no critical speaking to worry about. Number three, no vocabulary. And number three, uh, they're going to do one mock trial as opposed to three that's in the middle school class. Now, the difference in the middle school class, they're going to have a class book along with the reader that addresses different uh, logical fallacies. And number two, they're going to have, obviously, the CS homework along with the vocab as well. And number three, they're going to have more mature topics such as homosexuality, gay marriage, um, and finally, they'll have three mock trials along the term. Okay, let's go ahead and cover homework real quick. This class actually has quite a bit of homework for the students, but the homework is all geared to kind of prepare the kids for the next week in terms of what the debate topic may be. So, starting with the first part, P, okay, pros and cons sheet. Okay, this is what I would also like to call the general research paper, okay? So when preparing for a debate, obviously they need to come up with their raw arguments, okay? And then from that, they're going to get into something called specific research, and that's when they're going to find articles supporting those reasons, right? Okay, so research would be the second point. Number three, they're going to fill out argument sheets. In this case, I put down two because hopefully they'll bring in two articles for their uh, debate next week. Okay, number four, they're going to come in with uh, vocab sheets. And remember, the elementary class would not be expected to do this, okay? Whereas the middle school class, they'll have a vocab test the following week. Okay, IAP, it's called Interesting Article Presentation. And we'll go into this a little more in just a minute. And finally, online critical speaking, okay? The kids are going to be recording a response every two weeks online where the teacher's gonna come in and give feedback. And hopefully as a whole, their, their ability to kind of rebut an argument will increase dramatically. All right, so let's go and talk a little more about critical speaking. Critical speaking, uh, they're going to go to a, a website. They're going to go ahead and listen to the initial argument by the proposition side. And what they're essentially trying to do is identify five logical fallacies that were committed by the proposition speaker. In response, they're supposed to go ahead and record their voice for two minutes, in which case they give a counter rebuttal. Okay? All right, your role as a teacher is to come in after all that's done and listen to it, write some feedback, and record some feedback. Now, when you're writing the feedback, what we're focusing on is your identification of, uh, or their identification of logical fallacies, and how effective uh, they went ahead to rebut those fallacies. Okay? Number two, your verbal response. We're going to focus more on the stylistic issues. In this case, their word choice, 
their voice, their emphasis, their use of rhetorical devices. Um, how believable did they make their, their rebuttals seem to be? And finally, if you have any further questions, the, the manual called Master Club Critical Speaking Manual, which is available on the FTP, is very thorough with all the information and model uh, responses. Okay? My biggest suggestion to you is to kind of make a template uh, of the five logical fallacy responses and kind of adapt it to each student's answer. Remember, you're getting paid 4,001 for each of these responses, so hopefully you can cut down the time a little bit. All right, let's go to IAPs. Interesting article presentation. Now, I've seen some classes where students have actually brought in an article, got up in front of the class, and just talked about the article. Hopefully you as the teacher can kind of move on to kind of address a few more things besides just talking about the article. What the kids need to do is find an article that is based on a serious topic, a serious issue, and something that's kind of relevant to current times. I am they're going to get up there, summarize for maybe about 30 seconds, and try to find what other underlying themes might be at play causing this issue to happen. And it doesn't necessarily have to equal the issue that's portrayed in the article. And from that, hopefully the kids will go ahead and get a lot of practice for their final presentation at the end of the term. Okay? Now, realistically, you're not going to have enough time to get everyone up there. So to draw everyone else into the discussion, I would go ahead and have the other students go ahead and ask questions along the line of their presentation or following their presentation. I usually tell my students, if they ask great questions, keep that talk, uh, speaker talking, they don't have to go next. All right? But anyways, it could be a lot of fun if it's done right. Uh, I would go ahead and challenge you as a teacher, maybe after three and four weeks, go ahead and give them index cards and tell them to write only five keywords instead of relying so much on their script or their article. All right, anyways, but remember, the key focus is to prepare for their final presentation at the end of the term. Okay, moving on. Logical fallacy lesson. In class, you're going to be addressing two new logical fallacies per week. And hopefully, along with the introduction of those fallacies, you can go ahead and give some examples, as, a, along, oh, as well as kind of teaching them how to attack those fallacies when it comes up in an actual debate. All right. For elementary class, you're going to be going over a little more debate skills and a little less on the logical fallacy side, whereas Master Debate 102M, you're going to go ahead and go into more of the logical fallacies. All right, this can be a little tricky sometimes, but remember, for C2 debate, for Eagle, ABO, ABO Plus, the kids have already been exposed to the common types of fallacies. All right, so they're pretty good at identifying them, they're just not very good at attacking them. Uh, the kids, in all honesty, in my classes, still get mixed up. They think everything's slippery slope, or they, if somebody has an ar argument opposing the other side, they automatically think it's ad hominem. So clarify the distinctions between each fallacy. All right. You as the teacher, I would kind of recommend that you kind of know on hand how to identify and attack maybe 25 to 30 of the fallacies that are commonly used. Okay? Stay away from getting the kids to learn too many of the fallacies and getting them all mixed up. Aside from that, a couple tips. Online critical speaking, as it will go over rebuttals, I would go ahead and the week prior to their online submissions, go ahead and give them that piece of paper with their script and see if they can kind of identify some of those fallacies. And if you go ahead and cover it in class, obviously they're going to feel a little more empowered when they do their online submissions. Okay. Okay, roundtable discussion. As you can see here, I'm not really going over the time restrictions for each of these components as um, each master teacher, they kind of bring in variety into the classroom. Obviously, one week they would focus more on the roundtable discussion. Other weeks they would cut down on the logical fallacy lesson. So that discretion I leave up to you. All right, for roundtable discussion, the kids are going to get into groups. And they're going to go ahead and share some of their articles that they found and figure out which articles would support which arguments and kind of strategize how they would like to approach the debate when it actually starts. Okay? Um, I myself, I give my kids about 10 minutes. Now, this kind of depends on their articles that they bring in. The, the more that they've prepared, the less time you actually need to give them in class. All right? So go ahead and prep them up the prior week. 
Okay, some common pitfalls. The kids really don't know what is um, an article that has credit, like a, that comes from a credible source. So, the first few weeks, I would go over what credibility actually means, okay, and what reliable sources that they can fall on. Okay, for instance, Wikipedia. We always get in the dilemma, is Wikipedia a trustworthy site? Okay, remember, they're not grad students, they're not college students, so I would say that it would be okay for the kids to start with Wikipedia, and especially for the more obscure topics of debate, this may be a good uh, beginning point for your students. All right, in talking about reliability, let's go ahead and talk about something called the hierarchy of proof. All right, what I tell my kids, they want to try to find their research that kind of encompasses more facts and statistics. Okay, that would be the higher tier of uh, reliability. Moving along the lines, expert opinions, depending who the expert is, of course, uh, they should go ahead and find articles that have more expert opinions. I would try to discourage my kids from bringing in too many personal experiences as they are no expert and it would probably not get them too far in terms of argumentation. Okay? Okay. The next component of class that you're going to cover with your kids would be the mock trial. Now realize we don't cover this very often in class, but the next level of masters is complete mock trial. Okay? So it's a good idea to expose your kids to uh, mock trial. In all honesty, my kids love doing mock trials in class as it requires a lot more role playing. Okay? When one kid is asked to uh, play out a role as if he's the killer, I mean, who wouldn't like that, right? Okay, so there are different roles along the line okay, for a mock trial. You're going to have three witnesses who are going to come in with their witness statements on both sides, okay, for both the defense and the prosecution side. You're going to have lawyers. Okay? And finally, you're going to have a judge and jury. Um, in my classes, I try to eliminate the judge and jury and add more of the students to the lawyers. If you can get two or three lawyers for each side, that's wonderful. And remember, try to put your strongest students in the lawyer roles. And this will make your mock trial overall uh, very interesting and, and exciting for the kids as a whole. Uh, you remember, the lawyer's going to come in. They're going to give an opening statement for about two to three minutes. Following the opening statements, the judge will kind of uh, guide them into the direct examination, in which case, uh, have the witnesses go ahead and write the questions for the lawyers, and then following the direct examination, we come through with the cross-examination. All right. Mock trials can be fun. Uh -oh. Mock trials can be fun, but there are some difficulties involved with mock trials, especially when you have a group of two students. How can you have a mock trial when you have eight roles involved? You, the teacher, at this point can get involved. I would really discourage you from being the lawyer role, but certainly for witnesses come in. Okay? Other than the small class sizes, the objections can be a little difficult to learn for the students. Um, there are handouts online on the FTP that go over all the objections, but good recommendation, cover the basic few okay, and have the kids practice um, using those objections. Those objections would be more of the narrative, leading questions, okay, maybe hearsay. All right. All right, if you keep it simple and focus on the, the content and the presentation, I think you'll have a lot of fun. Okay, so let's get into the formal style of debate. Okay, the British parliamentary debate is commonly the one that we use often in the Master 100 or 102 levels. And the reason being, uh, there's a particular way of speaking, there's a particular way of um, addressing the speaker, and there's a particular order. Okay? In terms of addressing the opponent or the speaker, we commonly have the students stand up and say, Honorable Mr. Speaker and fellow debaters. All right? So throughout the debate, even when they end their speech, Mr. Speaker, we yield more time. Okay? In this uh, form of debate, we're going to go ahead and have two teams. There's going to be a government and an opposition side. For each side, there will be an opening team and a closing team. But just to keep things simple, let's go ahead and say there are just two teams of four speakers on both sides. Okay? On the proposition side, the government side, we have the prime minister. Taking a step back, the government side, remember, they have the burden of proof, so they need to prove the case. All right? So the prime minister, he's going to go ahead and come in 
uh, as the first speaker. Following the Prime Minister, we're going to have the Leader of Opposition. Okay? Following the Leader of Opposition, we're going to come back to the positive side with the Deputy Prime Minister and then the Deputy Leader of Opposition. So as you can see the pattern, it's going to crisscross back and forth. Okay? The third set is going to be the members. And finally, we come in with the, the government and opposition whip, which case you want to go ahead and put your strongest speakers probably as the prime minister and the whip speakers. Okay, Okay. so let's go ahead and outline some points. What exactly would the prime minister actually say? There are a lot of uh, material on the FTP that kind of address these things, so I'll go ahead and streamline it as much as possible. All right, so first of all, like I said before, you want your strongest speaker here. Okay, they're going to come in and kind of establish a context through their hook. In their context, they need to explain why exactly is this debate so important. Okay, how does it apply to them? How does it apply to Korea? And finally, why is it relevant as a whole? Following the context, we're going to go ahead and address the stance. And remember, they're going to go ahead and carry out the common uh, debate language. Okay, following that, they're going to go ahead and define the terms. We're going to address this a little more with the next role coming up. And then finally, signpost their team's arguments. And what I mean by signpost, pretty much they need to go ahead and speak their arguments in a way that allows the judge or the adjudicator to go ahead and take notes. At any time they look at the judge and the judge is not taking notes, they're obviously losing points. So we're going to say what we're going to talk about later. And that's what signpost essentially means. Okay? All right, the leader of opposition, pretty much the same stuff. The only difference is they can challenge the definition that the Prime Minister gave. Okay? Sometimes the Prime Minister will give a definition that's biased and that creates kind of a difficulty in terms of the leader of opposition coming in and creating a clash. In that case, they can challenge the definition and give a new one. Okay? Just to keep things fair though, you as the teacher, I would go ahead for the first several weeks, just give them the definition. And that will kind of avoid the situation as a whole. OK, moving along the lines. OK, the Deputy Prime Minister, exactly as it says here, they're going to go ahead and rebut. And they're going to expand on their arguments. OK, now, taking a step back, remember, Prime Minister and Leader of Opposition, they went ahead and expanded on two of their four arguments. And then the Deputy Prime Minister and Deputy Leader of Opposition expanded on their last two arguments. Okay. So what exactly is the member going to do? The member has an important choice to make here. Okay. Number one, they can choose to go ahead and bring the debate into a new area. Okay. And this might strategically uh, help them win the debate. Or they can go ahead and um, just rebut what the, the opposition had rebutted against their first speaker. Okay. So in this case, we'll call it rebut the rebuttals. But remember, Effective rebutting of rebuttals requires a lot more evidence, okay, rather than just their opinions. Okay? And the member of the opposition is going to come in with the same deal. All right, so what's missing? The whips. Okay? So let's go ahead and address the whip. The whip is going to be the game changer. I have seen a team that just did horribly in their first three initial speakers, but then they saved the, their champ for the whip and they won the debate. So how did they do it? Okay, so the whip, remember, their primary role is to go ahead and highlight the clashes. Okay, so what exactly does clash mean? It means that all the points through the debate that they disagreed on uh, against the other team, they need to go ahead and prove that they've come in and destroyed those arguments. Okay, and that's essentially what they want to do in a whip. Along the lines, uh, Continue on, they also need to go ahead and work on style. Okay? I say, I recommend that you save the strongest speaker because hopefully that speaker is going to have a lot of style. And in this case, they're able to leave a lasting impression with the judge. Okay? They're able to go ahead and communicate with the judge if, they, if the judge was kind of leaning towards voting for the opposition team or the other team, why would that be a grave mistake? Okay? And finally, they're going to go ahead and close up any last minute rebuttals or attacks. All right? Okay. Some other rules that you need to know for a British parliamentary debate. Okay. Obviously, 
address the judge as Madame or Mr. Speaker. Okay? You need to end your speech with, I yield my time. Common etiquette. Throughout the debate, you want to have good debate manners. Okay? So in this case, applauding when a speaker comes up, applauding when a speaker sits down. So you, the teacher, need to train your students to actually carry out these different forms of etiquette. Okay? Finally, signpost all the way through, keeping the judge um, involved through the process. And finally, be wary of the speaking time. So what is a good amount of speaking for a par British parliamentary debate? Uh, for a competitive debate, it would probably be around five to six minutes. Now, I'm sure you would probably uh, be surprised if your kids can actually reach a four-minute mark. So for the first several weeks, let's go in and target two to three minutes each speaker. Okay. POIs. Now, if you've taught debate before, you'll know that there are different forms of kind of jumping out um, and objecting. Okay, those would be the POPP, POO, okay, POC. Generally, for my classes, I stay away from getting too in depth in my explanation of these three because the judge, most of the time, is watching the debate and has a good, um, good eye on whenever you know, people are breaking the rules. So in that case, POO um, obviously would just be a waste of time. POI, however, is very important for several reasons. Okay? To announce a POI, the kids are actually going to stand up and just say, point of information, sir or madame. Okay? In the old days, they would stand up, actually this hand, and say POI. But you can just have your kids just stand up and uh, speak out. Okay? All right. The speaker, on the other hand, is going to respond to a POI by simply saying, yes, thank you, or no, thank you. In which case, if they say no, thank you, the, the, the challenger will sit down. Okay? When giving a POI, it's very important that you teach your kids to go ahead and limit it to 15 seconds. So they can go ahead and address a POI or, or challenge with a POI by stating it as a statement or a question form. Okay? I usually tell my kids to kind of cut the POI down to about 5 to 10 seconds. Because if you'll see, if you spend about 15 seconds on a POI, the speaker is allowed time to kind of re-strategize which direction he would like to take the rest of his speech. All right, anyways, POIs are important because they allow, number one, uh, they show the judge that the listening team is still involved in the debate. Okay? Number two, it kind of is a way to throw the speaker off. Usually, the listening team has a good eye for, a good ear for kind of listening out to when the speaker is about to reach a climax. In that case, they'll jump up with the POIs to throw them off. And finally, um, they want to challenge a point that they heard. Okay, in this case, maybe something was not clear, or the fact was presented without a source, or finally, something that was claimed that the proposition had said, but they never actually said it. Okay, so in that case, they can stand up and challenge with the POI. Okay, but anyways, the last thing I would like to go ahead and point out is the debate timer app. Okay, this is something that I saw the judges using at the last debate competition for Cheongdam. And it's a free app that you can download to your phone or tab that allows the, uh, the first bell and the last bell for protected time to actually automatically go ahead and do itself. All right? Anyways, that's pretty much British parliamentary debate. Moving on, the public forum debate. I don't think I need to say too much. Pretty much a standard with both teams with four speakers. Okay? Now, they're only going to have three constructive reasons on the con side, three constructive reasons on the positive side. The only difference is in between each set of two speakers, we're going to go ahead and throw in a crossfire debate. Okay? For the first two crossfire debates, I would just go ahead and have that speaker for both sides stand up and argue their points against each other. For the last crossfire debate, we call it the grand crossfire. Let's have the whole class stand up and do a, just an open crossfire rebuttal. Okay? As you can see, this kind of lightens the mood and gets everyone on board and having fun. Okay, anyways, that concludes our workshop for today. Uh, if you have any questions, please refer to your program guide. Uh, as always, it's been a pleasure. Take care. <laughs>